I'm Dr. Nicholas Cummings. I am a past president of the American Psychological Association and was a practicing psychologist in San Francisco for over 30 years. In 2011, I agreed to be interviewed by the National Association for Research and Therapy for Homosexuality, or NARTH. Although that interview lasted and was taped for over two hours, it was edited into a much shorter segment of less than 20 minutes. At the time, I was not aware that the interview would undergo such drastic editing and cutting of the material. I learned recently that the edited interview, which NARTH made available on their website and on YouTube, has caused quite a stir, to say the least. I recently celebrated my 91st birthday, and I find the World Wide Web rather daunting at times. I was oblivious to what it was being blogged about me. Actually, I'm not altogether sure what a blog is. As a result of the video interview that North cleverly edited, I find myself accused of being anti-gay. I watched the edited interview recently and was shocked at how it was edited and at what was completely cut from the interview. I was angered by what I saw as my opinions were grossly misrepresented. Some major points that I made were totally omitted, while others were completely removed from their context. I can understand why people viewing the edited interview would get the impression that I'm anti-gay and anti-lesbian. I made the mistake of believing that NARTH would keep the interview intact, and as a result, I inadvertently allowed NARTH to speak for me. Now, I'm speaking for myself in a video that will only be posted on the internet if it's kept in its entirety and after my review of the footage. In the NARTH interview, I adamantly stated that homosexuals cannot be cured, that is, made into heterosexuals nor should we ever attempt to do such a thing. For the record, I view such so-called treatment as highly unethical and a violation of human rights. In my over 65 years of psychological service and practice, I have never attempted to cure a homosexual for which, nor have I ever suggested that my students or trainees do so. Narth removed all of this during their editing process. Please indulge me for a few minutes as I give you some background that most younger mental health professionals would not know about me. You know, the over 20 years I was chief of mental health for Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, I hired openly gay and lesbian psychologists because many patients wanted and needed such practitioners. This was in the 1970s, when seemingly overnight San Francisco became a leading gay city, and long before most gay lesbian psychologists were out. When I hired openly gay uh, lesbian psychologists, it was an unprecedented move for which I experienced tremendous opposition at the time. Also at that time, no other agency or practice in the United States had openly lesbian and gay mental health professionals for patients who requested such therapists. Before I began hiring openly gay and lesbian psychologists, I was, believe it or not, the preferred psychologist of the lesbian and gay community in San Francisco. In fact, gay lesbian patients clamored to see me. My treatment style, like all patients, with all patients, was to be respectful of these patients' orientations, goals, worldviews, and circumstances. Many of my lesbian gay patients thought I was gay because I understood them so well, sometimes better than they understood themselves. Most people today are not aware that I was an early pioneer for lesbian gay rights. In the 1970s, when I was a member of the APA Council of Representatives, I introduced a motion in the council which stated that being gay or lesbian was not a mental illness and called for the American Psychiatric Association to remove that designation from their Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, or what is called the DSM List of Mental Illnesses. 
The motion passed two years before the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality as a mental health diagnosis. I was an invited guest of the American Psychiatric Association at their next annual meeting. When I walked into the opening reception, a cheer went up from half the room while the other half turned their backs. As president of the American Psychological Association, in 1979, I appointed the very first gay lesbian task force, which later became a division of APA. As a result of this, I received enthusiastic public recognition from lesbian gay psychologists at the 1979 American Psychological Association Convention in New York. At the risk of sounding immodest, I can honestly say that I prevented many suicides by my direct work with gay lesbian patients, by the work of those I hired to meet the needs of these patients, and by my advocacy for gay rights. At, at the age of 91, I, no lo I longer am a practicing psychologist, and I'm no longer able to directly help AG LGBTQ patients who are depressed and suicidal. However, I applaud the work of the Trevor Project in this area, and I am very proud to be a supporter of the Trevor Project. In the interview with Narth, I was not advocating reparative therapy. I was simply making the point that I disagree with the American Psychological Association's attempt to dictate treatment goals. My point is simply that a patient has a right to choose his or her own treatment goals, although it is up to the psychotherapist to let the patient know whether or not his or her goal is reasonable and attainable. For example, the AP at one time had a policy that it was unethical to assist a patient in leaving a homosexual lifestyle. Simply stated, the APA went too far. While the vast majority of people living a homosexual lifestyle are homosexuals, and we should not attempt to cure them, then since they don't have a disease to begin with, there are some patients who are not homosexuals but who have gotten involved in a lifestyle that does not suit them. There's some heterosexuals who enter into a homosexual relationship, just as there are some homosexuals who enter into a heterosexual relationship. While the latter is much more common, the small minority of heterosexual patients in homosexual relationships have the right to choose their own treatment goals. In fact, all patients have the right to choose their own treatment goals, and I will defend this basic human right. Unfortunately, NARS website and other media have grossly distorted my position on LGBTQ issues and rights. Essentially, NARTH has used and abused my name and reputation to legitimize a set of extreme beliefs to which I have never espoused. NARTH's use and abuse of my name is preposterous, egregious, deplorable, and several other adjectives that might not be appropriate in what I hope will be a widely distributed film. I find it ironic that NARTH, an organization that's supposedly based on morality and strong values, should behave so unethically in its video editing practices. Unfortunately, the NARTH interview video has gotten more attention than it should have, possibly because emotions have been running hot on both sides of the argument as the U.S. Supreme Court considered the issue of gay marriage and recently ruled that gay marriage is legal throughout the United States. In case you're wondering, I am delighted with the Supreme Court's recent decision of fa in favor of marriage equality, as I have always believed that people should be able to marry whomever they damn well please. In case I wasn't perfectly clear before, I adamantly and vehemently oppose the use of psychotherapy aimed at forcing lesbian gay people to quote, go straight. As you can see, I'm not particularly shy about stating that such so-called therapy is unethical, immoral, and disgraceful. 
I have requested that NARTH remove my name and image from all their website and their marketing materials. I've also requested that NARTH remove my grossly misleading edited interview from YouTube. I want nothing more to do with NARTH and emphatically disavow that organization and all that it stands for. <laughs>